Welcome everyone to our Lunch and Learn program. Happy to see you here. Um, as always, we'd like to go around and see if there's any guests that we would, if you'd like to introduce yourself or have a member that would introduce a guest, we'd like to know. All those fun people that are here to get information. So, yes, Howard. Particularly for not standing up, but I'd like to introduce Don Alba, my guest today. Don lives in Marina. Thank you very much for bringing it. Well, Welcome, Don. Okay. Any other guests, infrequent members who would like to introduce themselves? Yes, ma'am. We have Mr. Michael Fulmer and Steve Ensley uh, from Ontario. Uh, changed our time until 3 o'clock and um, <clears throat> we're going to be having a review for the National League of Women Voters on priorities for programs and that will again be at our board meeting on February 12th at 3 p.m. at Mariposa Hall in the uh, conference room and any of the members are welcome to come or if you're unavailable to come and you have some ideas for um, some program priorities, we'd love to have that in input for our meeting. Um, also, as a reminder, somebody at the board meeting may have left their umbrella behind. They don't need it today, but they might need it sometime. So it has been turned in to me. If anybody recognizes it, we'd be happy to have them have that. And also, um, just as a reminder, we have just gone through our membership renewal, and we appreciate all those who have renewed. And if there's anyone who would like more information and would like to join our lovely group, we have a brochure outside with information you can fill out and, and hand in to us, because we know um, it's always nice to have a impartial group that gives you um, information um, based on the, the pros and cons of most all of our, our issues that come up before us. So with that, I'm going to turn the program over to Janet Brennan, who is going to do a wonderful job of directing us through this program. So Janet, take it away. Before we uh, get into the program, I want to give you a great example of action at work um, Supervisor Alejo, who uh, was just became chair of the Board of Supervisors, the chair has the opportunity to change or make appointments to various committees. And out of the 50 appointments that he made, there were two that were changed, and they related to the two women on the Board of Supervisors. One was to remove Jane Parker from the Local Agency Formation Commission, which is scheduled to hear some very controversial annexation issues in the coming months. And the other was Mary Adams from uh, <clears throat> removed from the Cannabis uh, the, uh, <clears throat> Ad Hoc Subcommittee. An action alert went out on Monday night. Tuesday, Alejo had changed his opinion and uh, reappointed Jane to LAFCO. Mary was not reappointed. But because of that action alert and many 
of you who sent in emails to the chair, uh, I think that that is what made the difference. So always keep in mind, one vote, one vote makes a difference, and one letter or one email often makes a difference as well. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention since the League is always interested in uh, <clears throat> action on issues. This will be the uh, second program on the League's study to update its land use position on the former Ford Ord. The focus of the update relates to whether or not the Ford Ord Reuse Authority, which oversees the land use on the former base, should be extended. FORA is set to expire in June of 2020. At our March 8, 2017 meeting, our first speaker was Gail Morton, uh, who's a member of the Marino City Council and the FORA Transition Task Force, and she provided a great deal of background information arguing what, why FORA should not be extended. That videotape is a uh, and the complete the, uh, presentation is on our website. Today, we're going to hear the other side of the issue. Our guest speaker is Dr. Alan Hoffa, who will argue in favor of extending FORA. He is a member of the Monterey <coughs> City Council, for a board member, and a professor of English at uh, Monterey Peninsula College. He served three years on the MPUSD school board from 2004 to 2007, and he was elected to the city council in 2012 and re-elected in 2016. In that capacity, he represents the city on the board of community human services and the Ford Ord Rios Authority. We submitted uh, five or six questions that uh, we asked Dr. Hoffa, Hoffa to uh, respond to, and he does have a presentation, and after his presentation, we'll have questions from the audience. Please welcome Dr. Hoffa. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Janet, and thank you, League, for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Um, so I'm going to talk about for transition today. I just want to let you know I was on the transition task force along with Gail. Uh, we met, gosh, I don't know, a dozen times, at least a dozen times over the last several years. And so I have to let you know this issue is, is very complex. There's a lot of moving parts. Um, and today I'd like to explain why I ultimately supported, not a for extension, but the creation of a single user um, JPA that would be a successor to Fora. Um, next. So before I get into that, I'd like to um, give you a sense of who I am, those of you who don't know me, and um, help you understand why um, my values helped direct me towards the decision that I made. Um, first of all, it might be a surprise. Normally, um, at four uh, votes, I'm on the same side, more often than not, with Gail, with Jane. Um, and so this is an unusual, unusual vote. Um, but I want you to know a little bit about my values, which are aligned very much with those individuals. Um, number one, environmentalism. So our environment is intertwined with the well-being and the health of our community, spiritually, physically. Um, so protecting our environment, for me, is a very personal, important issue. There are a number of issues that I care about that are all connect, interconnected and in different ways um, connect with the former Ford Ord and redevelopment. Homelessness is one issue. Uh, affordable and workforce housing is another issue. Uh, environmental quality of life, and in particular transportation and how that relates uh, to our environmental quality of life. Keeping cars off the road reducing automobile pollution, for example. Um, water, which is necessary for us to live here and to have the um, jobs that support our economy. And of course, jobs. I teach at Monterey Peninsula College. I see, you know, every semester I see hundreds of, I teach hundreds of students. 
And I need to let you know that those young people are struggling. They're struggling to find jobs in, anywhere, and in particular here on the peninsula. So as you know, the former Ford Ord uh, base reuse plan has a few different objectives. One of those objectives is recreation and the environment, which I strongly support. Another objective is housing, which I strongly support. And another objective is jobs, which I strongly support. So it's really all about finding the balance. Um, and that's where good governance comes in. Um, for me, good governance requires us to focus on process. I'm very much a stickler for process, having good processes. Uh, structure, facts, and I think in this particular issue, there are a lot of facts out there that are in dispute, or that you may have heard, which are more nuanced than what you have heard, and I hope to clear, clear up some of those. Um, I think there are a lot of folks who don't like Fora because they don't like some of the personalities on Fora. Guess what? I don't like some of the personalities on Fora either. But that's not a good reason in and of itself to eliminate a um, deliberative uh, a body. So, um, and finally, regional decision making. I believe very much that all of those issues I've outlined, housing, homelessness, transportation, water, jobs, they all will require regional solutions. No one city can address all of those uh, issues individually. And I also believe that the former Ford Org is really essential to addressing all of those issues. Next. <clears throat> so this is my dog, Tilly. Uh, this picture was taken, no doubt, before the policy on dog on leash was changed. Uh, this, is, this is pretty much uh, the center of the monument. It's got an amazing view. It's about 11 miles in. Um, it's one of my most treasured places. Um, and I just want to let you know that I am someone who loves the former Ford Ord. Um, Gordon Smith from Keep Ford Ord Wild introduced me to uh, the former Ford Ord or, uh, lands and to Happy Trails, I don't know, maybe five, six years ago. And it's a place that I spend much of my time, almost all of my recreation time. I don't think there's any other elected official, with the possible exception of, of Mayor Delgado, who knows the trails better than I do. Um, and so I just wanted to let you know that for me, what happens there is personal. It matters to me. Next. So here I'd like to just outline some of the um, broad rationale for why I think a single entity, um, JPA, is the right way forward, and then I'll get into some detail. Uh, first of all, I think it's important that we have a regional body for planning at the former Ford Ward. I realize that some folks feel differently about that, and I'll get into that in a minute, but I think it is important that we have a regional body. I think that fairness is very important, fairness for all of the jurisdictions, and there are fairness issues, as I'll outline in a minute, um, with the, uh, without a successor JPA. There's a revenue challenge, as somebody who is believes very much in fiscal responsibility. Uh, that concerns me. There's a revenue challenge if we don't have a successor JPA. Um, there, there is an issue of water that I'll get into more, um, and the ability of Ford to provide oversight for the water supply uh, at the former Ford Ord. Uh, prevailing wage and fair pay protection is important to me. Uh, I am a labor person. I believe in the labor movement. I believe that uh, fair, good, good jobs uh, benefit everyone. And um, I'll say more about that in a second. And affordable housing is very important to me. Uh, next. So um, regional decision making and public input. Uh, development in various parts of Ford Ord have regional impacts on transportation, on jobs, on housing, and on the environment. I don't think that is in dispute. 
Um, Fora provides a public forum where the whole region can come and voice their concerns uh, and, and be heard. Um, the jurisdictions, if, if, for, if we don't have a regional JPA, yes, the individual jurisdictions will make those decisions. And yes, people can come and speak at those um, cities and county. But I submit, as somebody who sits on a city council, that city councils tend to discount input that comes from outside their jurisdiction. And so having a regional body, I think, provides a greater public voice. Um, it also provides a second voice for the public. So yes, something like Monterey Downs, which I personally oppose and work to help defeat, uh, yes, it could have simply been and was ultimately stopped by Seaside, but had the Seaside City Council make up, not change, it would have moved forward. Then there would have been another opportunity for the public uh, to say no at Fora. Um, so if, if you don't have that successor JPA, you're going to have one go at it. It'll be at the, at, at the jurisdiction level. Uh, as it is now, you have two goes at it. Um, Finally, I think that a regional single entity JPA provides the opportunity for jurisdictions to work through disagreements. And there are legitimate disagreements. Um, I think we know that there, there are times when forests fail, but there are also times where it's succeeded. Um, RUDGE, which are the re regional urban development guidelines, um, is one example of that. And, that came about through a process at Fora. There was a lot of public input. There were, um, there were uh, meetings on trails, on connections. And I think we came up with some pretty good guidelines so that you don't end up with things looking radically different as you go from one jurisdiction to another. Next. So the fairness issue here, as a representative of my city, and I understand other cities have different perspectives, and I completely understand why the representatives, for example, of Marina would favor elimination of a uh, forum, because doing so would financially benefit that city. And if you live in Marina, completely understand it. But I have to look from my city's perspective and also from the regional perspective. And so there is an issue of fairness. Elimination of Fora without successor would result in financial benefit to the city of Marina at the expense of other jurisdictions. Um, why? So the way it works is there are entitled projects. Those entitled projects are basically, they're ready to go. Um, uh, so and as soon as the permits are drawn for them and the work begins, at that point, the fees, development fees, are assessed. <clears throat> but if four goes away and those projects have not begun, have not uh, been permitted and, and fees paid, it's going to be very, very difficult for uh, the mitigations that are associated with those projects to be paid for. Because you can't, after the fact, after four is gone, you can't, um, you can't, once these projects have been entitled, you can't impose a fee on them. So essentially those entitled projects, and there's about 45 million of them in Marina, uh, and maybe another 25 million in Seaside and Delray Oaks, those entitled projects we won't be able to get impact fees from. Uh, so new fees can't be imposed on already approved projects. Uh, However, if FORA were to continue, or a successor JPA that had language indicating such, those existing fees would apply. Um, fees for transportation, water, and habitat will have a shortfall, and residents in other jurisdictions will bear an unfair share of those regional impacts. Next. So um, more broadly speaking, there will be a revenue challenge. Uh, as I mentioned, the existed uh, CFD, which is, is essentially the developer fee, will go away. It is true that jurisdictions can uh, create new uh, fees, new CFDs, but they may require a two-thirds vote of the residents within that proposed boundary, 
those residents may not want, they, they may already be there, they may not want to pay for the new development. The FOR's existing property taxing power is also, um, by legislation, it's greater than what can be replaced by a jurisdiction, so that's another potential shortfall in funding. <laughs> Uh, an analysis of the assets and liabilities shows for uh, with financial capacity to fill all requirements of the base reuse plan, but if, if, it's, um, if it's parceled out to different uh, entities, uh, there may be a shortfall as much as $70 million. Where is that going to come from? Next. So water protection. Um, the FORA board has authority to approve Marina Coast budget and rates for residents on the former Fort Ord. Uh, <laughs> Marina Coast Water District currently does not have a representation from residents on Fort Ord. I'm hoping that will change very soon, and I think that's actually on our agenda for Friday. Um, but without that kind of representation, one of my concerns, again, City of Marina has about 100 acres um, adjacent to Ryan Ranch in the former Fort Ord that could be developed. Um, what would prevent Marina Coast Water District from imposing higher than normal rates or fees on the residents of, of, of that land? So uh, I like having that opportunity as a representative of Monterey to be able to weigh in on that. And right now there's no representation aside from FORA for the Fort Ord residents uh, with respect to water rates. Next. Prevailing wage and fair pay protection. So if you're doing a job and you're supposed to get paid X amount, I believe you should get paid that. That's basic fairness. Uh, but I have to tell you, that's not happening. There, there are projects on the former Ford Ord where developers are not paying what they are legally obligated to pay workers. That's wrong. Um, the master resolution for FORA, Includes, um, includes a provision that requires <coughs> prevailing wage for all new generation construction. Now, if FORA, again, sunsets, will that prevailing wage provision apply? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. It's not clear. Um, and who will enforce it? Currently, the jurisdictions are not doing a very good job of enforcing it. Um, FORA has the authority to enforce it. Uh, we've not done as good of a job as we could and as I would like to see. Uh, we have created a position for a coordinator who works with the cities, tries to educate them and the developers on the rules regarding prevailing wage. But that is something that we could be more active. Uh, we have that authority, but if there isn't a JPA with that authority, who's going to enforce it? The same people who aren't enforcing it now. Next. Same thing with affordable housing. The base reuse plan calls for 20% affordable housing and 10% workforce housing. That's supposed to be out of the total makeup of housing. Um, it's very little of new affordable housing has been built. Most of the new construction is high end. Uh, and most of it is not serving the local population. It's people from the Bay Area. Um, and so this to me is, a, is, is very, very important. FORA could, through its consistency determination, approve, not approve projects if they don't clearly address their affordability inclusionary requirement. If FORA goes away, who's going to do that? Again, the same jurisdictions that now are not uh, requiring uh, affordable housing. Next. So uh, I did receive some questions. Some of these are really complex. I'll do my best to answer them, and I've kind of summarized them here. So number one, AB 1614 requires FORA to approve and submit a transition plan that shall assign assets and liabilities, designate responsible successor agencies, and provide a schedule of remaining obligations. How does the transition plan approved by FORA do this? First of all, there was a lot of confusion. The so-called transition plan was not the transition plan as required under AB 1614. Okay. That plan must be approved by the end of this year, by, the, by December of 2018. 
What the Fora Board did after several years of the task force meeting was give direction on staff on what kind of a transition plan we would like. Um, and so we directed staff, a majority of, of the board, to create um, a plan that would uh, envision a single entity JPA structure. It's not the final plan. Um, there will be more. And, um, and it will be submitted to, to LAFCO probably sometime in October. Um, so the transition task force did study the assets and liabilities and various methods of assigning them. We actually looked at three different kind of approaches. One would be just continue with the existing fora. Two, what if we parceled them out? And yes, you could send transportation to TAMC and you could send uh, you could create a new JPA for habitat. Um, you could ask the county to take care of the uh, munitions, remediation, etc. Yes, you could do it. We looked at that. We also looked at um, the idea of a, of a new JPA, a more streamlined JPA, and that's ultimately what we recommended. Next. Question two. The transition plan proposes a JPA replace FORA, Seaside, Marina, Monterey, and Monterey County would be required to participate. How could a JPA be established if not all jurisdictions agree? Um, so first of all, that would also include Delray Oaks. Delray Oaks is also a land use jurisdiction. Um, the transition team tried hard to find a concept that would satisfy all jurisdictions. In the end, we were not successful. Um, my friends in Marina were not. Uh, they, they simply wanted to expand FORA. Um, so we were not successful in doing that, and I, I'm disappointed we couldn't do that. Uh, the underlying powers of FORA would be transferred to this new JPA. Each jurisdiction will have to decide for themselves if it's in their interest to join. However, um, cities are still responsible for their regional impacts. Just because you get rid of FORA doesn't mean that a development project uh, in your share of the former Fort Ord won't have transportation and water habitat impacts that are regional in nature. And so um, you're still going to have, uh, you're still gonna have those, those impacts and fees. So I would submit that it's likely all of the land use jurisdictions would want to join so that they can have a voice. Um, let's see. So I don't believe that we should um, disband a regional body that is dealing with regional issues simply because one city um, doesn't favor it. Next. Question three. What analysis was undertaking of costs and benefits? Uh, as I mentioned, we met over a dozen times, the members of the task force had the ability to ask for any information uh, that they wanted, and, and they did do so. Um, and in the end, um, the board directed the staff to analyze the costs and benefits of those three different options. Uh, and I think the financial shortfall of some $70 million was one of the major uh, reasons why uh, the task force and ultimately the board recommended uh, a successor JPA. Next. Question four. Several agencies could assume responsibility for four tasks. In your view, what functions could not be undertaken by other agencies or processes? So it is true um, all of the all of the functions could be assumed by other entities with the possible exception of habitat uh, preservation, you probably have to create a new JPA specifically for that. Um, but this isn't really, this question sort of begs, this question begs the answer that somehow if, if all of these functions can be parceled out, then FORA serves no purpose. And that I think is where I beg to differ. Um, it's about fairness, it's about regional uh, forum, it's about uh, regional oversight, it's about the region being able to prioritize um, what we want done. Next question. Question five, if a new JPA were formed, 
What would staffing requirements and selection process for staff be? Would uh, salaries be comparable to current staff? <laughs> so the new JPA board would determine uh, staffing requirements and salary schedule. Um, hiring, I've been a part of many public agencies. Hiring is not done by a board other than hiring of the executive director. Once you hire the executive director, the rest of hiring is usually handled by that person. Um, I, I also want to let you know that the transition team specifically asked for a staffing plan. That many of us do have a concern about the cost of Fora's operations. And we, would, we, we asked staff to show us, um, as you complete your tasks, how will you begin to ramp down your staffing? And we were presented with a, a plan. By 2020, the staffing would be reduced from 16 to 10 or 11, and by 2025 to four to five staff. Next. Uh, transportation projects address internal impacts only. TAMC has identified insufficient FORA fees for regional impacts. How would extension of FORA address regional traffic? So I think there's a few uh, false assumptions there. Um, first of all, all m most of the projects at the former Ford Ord have both a regional and a base um, impact. Okay, and it's they're, they're assigned a percentage. Um, also, I think it's a false assumption that TAMC has said there's insufficient um, fees for this. In fact, every year, uh, FORA addresses fees and makes adjustments based on sort of um, a new analysis of, of costs and, and, and whatnot. So I, I don't think the assumptions here are actually accurate. Um, and to give you an example, I think also built into this is an assumption that FORA hasn't done anything regional. Uh, I would submit that Engine, for example, has both regional and on-site impact. Um, also in 2005, TAMC and FORA um, came to an agreement which has been recently um, ratified again in which there's a cost sharing um, FORA focusing more on base, uh, base impacts and doing TAMC's share of base impacts uh, with TAMC focusing on a corresponding reciprocal amount of regional. Uh, for is scheduled to pay its share of regional transportation need as projects are built. So um, I think what I would say to those of you who are my friends and are wondering why did I do this, I hope that you can at least understand. While I don't always agree with the decisions of Fora, in fact I'm quite often on the losing end, my preference would be let's change the membership of Fora. We can do that. Uh, I don't think that because we disagree with some de de uh, decisions in the past that that means we should eliminate the body. I think we maybe just need to change some of the members on that body. Thank you. And I'd be happy to answer your questions. Um, we will accept questions from the floor. If you're making comments, I will stop you. <laughs> Questions only. Ben. Alan, you mentioned several um, issues, which to me point to a bigger problem. Who enforces prevailing wage? Supposedly for it. Do they do it? No. Who's responsible for implementing affordable housing rules that are in the plan? For it. Do they do it? No. Why has Flora not done anything about so many issues? I would include, as you say, let's not talk about things from the past. Well, unfortunately, they had a huge amount of money from the Army. We ended up having to track down what happens to that money. As far as I know, none of it was spent on blight. It was all spent on ordinance. I never saw any documentation 
how it could have costed that much. Okay. Why, no, why it has not for, performed as it should. And I think that you have to look to the composition of four of the people who are running the show. Uh, I will uh, <coughs> uh, Sorry, rephrase question. the question for the uh, video videographer. Um, question relates to how FORA has enforced affordable housing requirements, uh, how it has enforced the uh, um, wage requirements, and finally, what, it, what has it done in terms of uh, addressing blight? Thank, thank you, I really appreciate the question. So, um, first of all, FORA has built into its master resolution a requirement for prevailing wage. Uh, it's not clear that if FORA sunsets without a successor, that that um, requirement will continue. Uh, could, it have, could it have done a better job? Yes, it could. So could the jurisdictions. So the jurisdictions have police power. They could enforce it. They, um, they, they could build in, for example, penalties for developers when they, um, when they, uh, when they go enter into agreement with the developers, um, and then they could enforce those. Uh, and yes, FORA could also do more. What, what they have done um, at the request of a number of us was hire a coordinator. Um, why haven't they done more? Because the jurisdictions that are building uh, projects and that are working with developers don't want it to. So at least that's what it looks like to me. So I, you know, um, I would like to see us do more and I think we could do more. Same thing on affordable housing. Uh, so on the one hand, you're absolutely right. FORA, when it do has done its consistency review in the past, should have done, had a stronger held a stronger position on requiring the inclusionary housing as projects went forward. But, so you're now going to trust the jurisdictions who also aren't doing it, right? Same thing with prevailing wage. Yes, it's true, FORA hasn't done as much as it could on affordable housing and on prevailing wage. But if you eliminate it, now you're just trusting the jurisdictions alone and they certainly haven't demonstrated uh, an ability or a willingness to, to do that either. Um, regarding the um, uh, removal of blight, uh, FOR has done a lot, but it could do more, and I'm hoping that we will do more. I'm hoping that on Friday, for example, when we examine our CIP, that we will make uh, blight removal a higher priority and maybe a project like Eastside Parkway a less of a priority. Um, so all I can say is, you know, you, you, you have to work with what you have and you do the best you can. Yeah. But FORA is costing us a huge amount of money. Gail presented numbers that were truly shocking. Not only this large staff, which you keep adding to, <coughs> Uh, retirement uh, benefits. Ben, we should have a question, please. The question is, why do we need FORA at that expense when the jurisdictions can perform equally poorly at no additional expense? <laughs> <laughs> so the question is, uh, why do we need FORA to perform tasks that local jurisdictions can undertake themselves? So I think I've laid out what I think FORA can do that the jurisdictions can't. It's a regional forum. Um, it's another level of review. It's the legal authority to be able to, uh, to, to require various aspects of the master plan. Um, I don't necessarily dispute with you that it could do them more efficiently, and that's part of the rationale behind a new successor JPA. Our guest. Awesome. Thank you. Hello. Thank you, Dr. Hoppe. I appreciate um, hearing your presentation. Um, I will try to make these clear and concise questions, so my apologies if I get this bumble a little bit. So you say a regional forum, and you stated in your presentation that one city marina was the uh, lone descent 
in this transition plan. Why was at the board meetings, and that is not my recollection. So we had Seaside when the the the, uh, the standing member that sits in those meetings after X numbers of years was not present. The Seaside vote was no. Monterey County vote vote for Jane Parker was no. My question to you in this in this particular aspect is how many acres does your jurisdiction, Monterey, have of the 14,000 usable acres of development when I know those three those three positions and Marina alone has 90% of the responsibility. So my question there is how many acres do you represent with your vote when you say this is a regional unfairness? I would question the fairness question. And I do have more, so if you want me to ask another one. <laughs> Uh, the question relates to proportionality of uh, your vote versus the votes for Seaside and Marina and uh, the county which has far more uh, land that's uh, under the jurisdiction. Right. Don, thank you for the question. Um, first of all, I was talking about the transition team uh, at the transition committee. It was Marina that opposed it. After it got to the full board, Mary Adams changed her position. Um, and yes, Jane also was opposed to it. The seaside vote on the second on the second vote uh, was was in favor of AJPA. Um, Monterey um, has about 100 acres. It's a small amount out of the whole thing, but um, in terms of the regional <coughs> impacts and the cost of those impacts. Uh, we may end up bearing a much greater share than is appropriate if for a sunset. So we have a financial interest um, as well. Why? Uh, let's have someone else uh, have the opportunity for a question. Robin? Uh, it is not clear to me with your uh, the transition plan that CORE is proposing is JPA. If one entity, for example, let's just use Marina, does not want to join, is that means the JPA is not falls apart, or or who enforces this transition? I guess. The question relates to the proposed transition plan in terms of membership and what happens if one. Person, uh, one jurisdiction that's part of the JPA does not participate, and who would enforce the uh, JPA? So, so um, that's a good question. It's a legal question, and I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I will say this. There are other regional JPAs. Let's say TAMSI, for example. What would happen if a city decided they didn't want to participate with TAMSI? Would they no longer have regional, transfer, regional transportation costs? I think that they would. So um, this, is, this is a regional um, forum. And um, my, anti my understanding is that they would have, the, the cities would have the opportunity to participate. If they wouldn't, I don't think that means they're absolved of the impacts of their development that are regional in nature. So um, I believe they would still be bound by the um, master resolution and the base for use plan. But that's something that will have to be uh, investigated as we continue to develop our transition plan. This gentleman over there. Thank you. Uh, just wondering about uh, low income housing. It might be possible to tear down the barracks and uh, put some stuff there because there's already lots of infrastructure that's already there and it's might be a little bit simpler. The question relates to affordable housing and whether or not existing uh, buildings can be torn down and replaced with affordable housing. Uh, yes, they could. And I, I wholly support that. That's a great idea. Thank you. Um, Michael? Uh, I have two quick questions. One related to this JPA idea. Um, you know, currently, at least in my mind, that means uh, Pacific Grove and Salinas will no longer be voting members. Uh, and wouldn't that create pushback from them? And how can you shut them out? You know, aren't they going to try and stay in the game? My second question is related to um, 
public comment. We talked about this is, a, this is an opportunity for uh, the public to weigh in and maybe get a second chance to weigh in. And um, this is like a peeve that I've heard from a number of people and I share, which is the unagendized public comment always happens at the end of the meeting, which is different than almost every other jurisdiction. City councils usually have that stuff first. And what it does is force people who want to have an unagendized comment to come, you know, either estimate when they think the meeting's going to end or sit through hours of stuff that they may or may not be interested in. Okay. So why, why is that happening? Question relates, two questions. Uh, what about the jurisdictions that would not be invited to participate in the JPA, such as Pacific Grove? And the other part is, why is the public comment period at the end of the meeting rather than at the beginning for four board meetings? Okay, thanks for the question, Michael. So, um, first of all, one of the re another reason why um, a sex successor JPA was ultimately advisable rather than just continuing for in some form is because some of the other non-land use jurisdictions really want out. They don't want to necessarily be involved anymore. Um, but what was envisioned was that they would have the option. So if PG, Carmel, um, San City wanted to participate, they would have the option of participating. Um, and then they would be, um, basically they would be responsible for the operational part, a, a, a percentage of the operational part of the cost of FORA. So that would be a choice that they would have to that they would have have to make, but it was not envisioned that they would just be forced out. But part of it, part of what we heard was that, especially Pacific Grove is really kind of wanting out. Okay. The second part of your question um, is interesting one to me. Uh, I don't know. I've only been on Fora maybe four years. I don't know why they have public comment at the end. Um, if there was a lot of, if I get, if all of you think it should be at the beginning, um, please let me know, and, and that's something that I would be happy to bring up with the board. Um, I can imagine one reason might be just meetings start at two, and so maybe for working people, they can show up at four and uh, get off work and show up at four, and even if they weren't able to be there for the whole meeting, they could speak during public comment at the end. That's the only rationale I can imagine, but you know, I'll talk talk to uh, Mr. Goulart and, and some of my colleagues will look into that. Thank you. Uh -huh. yeah. Fred. Uh, could you expand a little bit on a, a couple of things? One would be, I'll call it the voting equity uh, that currently exists in FORA, because when we built FORA, there was a concern to ensure that some of those voices were allowed by structure to be louder than other voice, voices, and that wasn't based on how many acres you had. It was, it was a different formula. You might want to address that. There also seems to be a misconception that FORA has not done anything in the way of funding demolition. If, if you remember those details, I know, I, I can't remember if you could help under, us understand what has been, what actually happened with the demolition. And then as you talked about the region, right from the beginning there was the thought that Fora would look after Salinas's interest, PG's interest, and so on. And that there was a real purpose because there was a lot of infrastructure, housing infrastructure, water infrastructure. The question to address, to address how that how that worked because he alluded to it, but alluding to it as opposed to putting uh, numbers on it, I think would, would clarify between a bit between some fact and some fiction that I've heard this afternoon. Um, the first question relates to the voting structure uh, uh, of the four board and the fact that it isn't related to how much property you have, uh, uh, responsibility for. And the second part of the question relates to... Who, who paid the demolition at the beginning in Marina? Demolition. And then the last part was why do the other cities have an interest in this? Well, <clears throat> 
The second part of the question relates to demolition, and the third part is why would other cities be interested in the regional process? Yeah. So um, the voting equity is such that so the largest, the, the cities that have the greatest uh, economic interest in the former Fort Ord, Marina and Seaside and the county, each have two votes. Okay. Other cities, so Monterey, we have one vote. Carmel has one vote. Um, I don't understand. I, I honestly don't know the history behind how that, what, what the formula was used to arrive at that. But that is partly that thing. Speak to Don's question about fairness. Um, I think that would be something that, with a successor agency too, we'll have to have a conversation about. Like how 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 do you address your concern to make sure that um, certain jurisdictions have proper voting representation on that successor agencies. I don't know what the answer is. Um, demolition. So again, this is way before my history, but when the former Ford or base reuse plan was adopted, um, you know, there was an agreement between which entities would be responsible for which <coughs> demolition requirements. Okay? So Ford or the Ford Ford or reuse authority has responsibility for a certain amount of the demolition. Um, they've completed about 85% of it. So 85% of FORA's legal responsibility has been, um, has been removed. Um, and then the cities had various responsibilities. So most of the blight that you, uh, that you saw recently, a lot of it was on CSUMB. That was CSUMB's responsibility. They've recently begun removing a lot of that, and a lot of it that you still see is Marina's responsibility. Um, so, and then finally, I think that the other cities have an interest because the transportation impacts will certainly impact them, and the housing uh, will impact them. So, you know, and jobs will certainly impact them. So, making sure that we get the right mix of all of that is going to have an impact on every single city in the area. Sylvia. So, uh, Fora has been edited for over 25 years, and not much is done. How, why would you think forming a new organization would do the trick? The question relates to the fact that FORA has been in existence for a number of years and whether what makes you think that uh, a new JPA or a new organization would accomplish more than the existing one? Right. Well, um, I just have to say I don't think it's completely accurate to say it hasn't accomplished much. Look at, look at CSUMB. That's pretty amazing. Uh, look at university housing. There's a lot, there actually is a lot of homeless. Uh, you know, people talk to me because I care about homelessness. There, there was a lot of, a lot of buildings that were, were in fact redesigned, recommissioned for homelessness. I think there's about 300 units or so out there. Um, the, look, look at what is now happening in uh, Marina. So I think that there's a lot going on. I think you have to take into account how devastating the recession was. That was something that was out of any of our control and that really set things back. Um, I also think back in the early 2000s, you had a different city council in Marina that was problematic in ways. Uh, I think you had a council in Seaside that was obsessed with Monterey Downs rather than on other projects that would have maybe been better and more developable. So those those aren't, I don't think you can put all the blame on Fora. I'm going to take the privilege of the moderator and ask a question. Okay. Uh, one of your positions is that we need Fora as a regional planning. Uh, agency. And our review of the consistency findings that FORA has made over the years, the impression is that it's pretty much a, a rubber stamp for what local jurisdictions want. I think that FORA has only once found a general plan inconsistent, and that's the Monterey County general plan, which is still in that state. So could you address that particular issue? 
Well, I would agree with you. I think that they, that they should have uh, exercised their authority more often, and, um, and I'm hopeful that um, a new successor JPA will do that. Bill? Yeah, um, my, uh, the message they get from you, Alan, uh, uh, and your view, which I respect a great deal, is that yes, uh, Fora has not done a very good job of what it has been uh, 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 tasked to do, but if we get rid of Fora, it, it's going to get a lot worse. It could. Yeah, so, uh, and you alluded to the fact that there's a lot we can do to change how Fora operates. So as a private citizen, how would you suggest I, as a citizen of Monterey, um, and a voting member of the Monterey County Democratic Central Committee, how could I uh, get or off its backside to go in the direction I want to? Question relates to how would a JPA perform uh, effectively to address some of the issues you've identified? So specifically what you could do or anyone could do is, um, let me just say, a board, a city council, there are good city councils, there are bad city councils. It, it's really a makeup of who is on that council. Same thing with school boards and same thing with this kind of a board. So if you don't like the kinds of decisions, the four board, I can guarantee you that if the four board gives this direction, the executive director is going to go in that direction. That's how it works because they can be hired, they can be fired by a board. So the problem is that we haven't, we have the board hasn't always um, had the right makeup. So if you don't like the, the decisions that it's making, identify those folks and um, work to replace them. It's really that simple. I mean, that's how government works. Come back to you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so my question is, I, and you said about your city's impact with the 100 acres. Um, that may or may not be, I might not, not agree with that. So as a transition task force, I have not been able to find anything on the Fora website or when I asked this at the board uh, meeting the last. There should be a staff report or some kind of uh, documentation on when you look at those three options of the transition task force and what the pros and cons for each of those were and the impact of each of the jurisdictions from those to get to your recommendation of a single entity JPA, that is nowhere in the public domain. So I can't, I may or may not agree with you, but I would like to, as a public member, be able to work through the data that you made the decision on because the way that I understand the board, the transition task force sent the, the the or the, the next steps or their recommendation wasn't exactly as open and, and informative as it maybe should be. Okay, um, this is a this is a question that I wanted an answer to, and it is basically how can the league or interested citizens obtain the data and information that the transition task force had? So. Uh, we can evaluate that decision. Great question. So um, a lot of the information, if you go to the website and you go to boards, uh, uh, to, to commissions, and you scroll down to the transition task force, there are a number of different presentations uh, there that some of this is addressed. But I think I'm going to ask, I see our executive director here, I think what we do need to do, and, and I will, believe uh, we could have and should have done a better job of communicating with the public and uh, making clear some of the information the Transition Task Force look, looked at, is if we could identify some of those specific bits of information and make them sort of like linked right to the front page of our website. So I'm going to talk to our staff and see if we can do that for you, okay? Okay, uh, Lisa and um, and then George, and then we'll wrap it up. Lisa? Well, I question the bias of the transition team who has composed of staff who stands to lose their well-paying job before it is not extended. And I wonder if an outside consultant should have been used for this purpose. Could an outside consultant have been used to help prepare a transition plan? Is that the question? I mean, yeah, that would be an additional expense. Um, I think that 
you know, again, this really comes down to with basic trust. And, you know, if you don't trust people, then, yeah, you're always going to want to consult them. Um, in, in, as we're going through the process, had I felt like we were not getting the information that we needed on the task force, or if the information that we were given didn't make sense to me in terms of sort of logic, uh, then I might have felt the need to do that. Um, I would never, through the process, the staff that were not on the committee, first of all, that's a misconception. Uh, the committee was chaired by a representative from CSU and B, and the members of the task force, there was a, a Gail was on it, I was on it, uh, Mary Adams was on it. Uh, I think there was a person, a representative, an elected official from each of the land use jurisdictions. Um, so, you know, at our last meeting when we adopted this, this direction for the future transition, uh, some of my friends tried to make some alternate motions, and I wasn't able to make my alternate motion just because of Robert's rules. But what I was asking us, what I, the motion I would have made would have been essentially that. Let's give this direction now. Let's move. We, we, want, we have to have a plan complete by the end of this year. So let's get going in this direction. This is where most of us want to go. And then, yes, let's also hire a consultant with very specific sorts of questions that we ask them so that it, it, it doesn't get overly expensive. So that was going to be my motion. I wasn't allowed to make it. Um, I, I don't think more information is a bad thing, but I do kind of dispute a little bit that there's some kind of inherent bias or that um, in the end, it's the board that is making this decision. It's the board that was asking for the information. And in the end, it's really a policy and a political decision more than anything. George. Uh, you mentioned trust in this last comment, and as I go to that a little bit, um, before I had 20 years of life, basically, the extension was done four years ago. It was very clear in the extension that the uh, board was expected to produce a report that went to LAFCO for their consideration. It's four years down the road. We're now two years from the end. You're right now saying that these instructions to staff will be clear enough in the next weeks in order to get to LAFCO by this fall? I think it's a trust question here, and I'm asking you, what trust do you have that this, that kind of schedule can be met? Well, the, um, <clears throat> under the legislation, FOR is required to issue a report to LAFCO, and that report is due soon, and the question is, what confidence do you have that that report will be forthcoming? So I have confidence, yes. Uh, it isn't like the, the, the full plan is due tomorrow. Remember, it doesn't have to be approved until December of this year. Um, uh, the schedule is to get it to LAFCO, I believe, in October. So yes, I do, I'm, I'm very confident. Um, and again, I just have to remind folks, the recession, that was a big deal. That was, that was uh, as big as anything we've seen since the Great Depression. There was nothing happening. You could have had any board, you could have had any staff at Fora. There was nothing that was going to happen for about seven years there. So, you know, I do think in fairness that you have to acknowledge that. We will end the meeting at this point. I'm sure Ellen will be around to answer individual questions you might have. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, our next meeting will be on immigration and uh, immigration policies and the impact on agriculture in Monterey County. So that is another uh, controversial issue that we'll be addressing. So thank you very much. Everybody.